Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Awayan from the Land Transport Authority in Singapore. So it is indeed a privilege uh, to be invited to speak to this uh, distinguished uh, audience in this room. Uh, today, I will be sharing a bit about the evolution of Singapore's private vehicle policies, um, providing a practitioner's uh, perspective on how economics and market design have been applied to road pricing and also vehicle ownership uh, policies. Now, now, because the session is uh, live streamed, um, so as per the authority's uh, policy, I have uh, got to say that, um, to preface my remarks to saying that these are just my personal reflections and that uh, I'm not necessarily representing the official position of the Singapore LTA. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, first, maybe um, for those uh, for those in the room who are a little less familiar about um, our geographical context, um, I just want to uh, mention, uh, as you can see in the graphic uh, uh, on the slide in front of you, uh, Singapore is a densely populated, highly urbanized city state uh, with very limited land space. So roads take up about 12% of uh, the total road space, uh, sorry, of total land area, uh, and that's not far behind uh, housing at about uh, 15%. So therefore, with these uh, land constraints, uh, there is limited scope to increase road capacity uh, without compromising other land uses such as security and economic development. So uh, I searched up the widest freeway in the world, did a Google search on that, and um, the image of a KD freeway in Texas popped up. And at least in this picture, um, it looks like there are close to 20 lanes in each direction. And of course, this is a freeway of such a scale that I cannot imagine something similar to be built uh, in Singapore. So now in tandem with our investments in high quality public transport to provide the mobility alternatives to the car, we also need to restrict access uh, to and also the usage of the private car. And so this is to optimize the carrying capacity of the roads. So you might have seen some version of the picture on the right uh, illustrating just how much more space efficient a bus is and generally speaking public trans transit is uh, relative to the private uh, single occupancy car. So, allowing every household uh, to own a car is a luxury that a land-constrained country can ill afford. So, currently, car-owning households make up about 35% of all households in Singapore. Um, that's a little higher than what Mike, was, Mike thought it was, maybe something like 5%, but uh, it's a little bit higher than that. Uh, but, of course, not surprisingly, uh, it is a lot lower than uh, in the US, where about 92% of uh, all households have a car or cars. Now, but even as we uh, restrict uh, car ownership, um, it is also clear that among those households who are privileged enough uh, to own a car, we cannot allow its unbridled usage. Now, so because of the historical radio land use patterns uh, and tidal nature of traffic flows uh, between the downtown core, the CBD, and the outlying residential areas, uh, congestion hotspots will emerge if we don't do anything about that. So as you can see, the CBD is in the center south of the island, and there are residential areas to the north, to the west, and northeast, and the east. And so this is what's causing, what's going to cause that radial uh, pattern, that tidal pattern flows. So having a com combination of vehicle ownership and road usage measures are needed, uh, including uh, the ownership measures to control vehicle growth, and uh, usage measures such as our electronic road pricing, that's ERP for short, and that's, and that's a form of uh, congestion pricing. So now some cities uh, may have introduced, you may, you may know of some cities that have introduced hard ownership measures. Um, so for example, uh, Beijing's uh, license plate lottery, so it's, that's a hard ownership measure. Uh, some cities may have, you would also know that they have introduced road pricing measures like uh, London, uh, Stockholm, uh, but Singapore is, to the best of knowledge, uh, the only city and country in the world to fully rely on a dual combination of ownership and uh, usage uh, restraints. I use these extreme measures. So many in the room are undoubtedly familiar with the evolution of the theory of congestion pricing from uh, Arthur Pigou's work in 1920 on externalities and welfare uh, to William Vickery's uh, ideas about time of day pricing in the 1950s and then to the Smith report which was commissioned by the UK government in 1964. Now, uh, Singapore was the first country to take up many of the recommendations of the Smith report with the introduction of congestion pricing in practice in the form of the area licensing scheme or the ALS in 1975. So this is a pricing mechanism to discourage car usage into the more congested parts of the CBD. We call that the restricted zone. And uh, paid labels were required to enter the restricted zone. Initially, those were just for cars and taxis. Uh, later on, uh, in subsequent years, they were extended to motorcycles and the commercial vehicles. Uh, implementation of ALS saw an immediate 44% uh, decrease in the number of motor vehicles entering the RZ during restricted hours. Uh, however, we had to contend with some uh, shortcomings of the ALS. 
so the paper labels that people had to buy to enter the, the restricted zone, they were uniformly priced. So that means that the scheme could not fully really flex, uh, flexibly respond to time of day uh, or time varying demand. And in, the, in addition, then the search for labels on the days where demand is more price inelastic, let's just inclement weather days, uh, can be quite costly and frustrating. And also, uh, enforcement was needed to ensure that vehicles entering the restricted zone, uh, they possess a proper paper license for that day. And this was, uh, of course, quite a labor intensive exercise. Um, so the uh, area licensing scheme uh, then evolved into the automated uh, ERP in 1998. Uh, and the raison d'etre of the ERP was to encourage motorists to consider the most optimal time, route, and mode of transport for the journeys. Uh, ERP harnesses technology through what we call the in-vehicle units, uh, or IUs, to allow charges by time of day and by location if, uh, if you're not entering the coordinate, uh, providing that the more targeted pricing. Um, charges can also vary by time of year. So for example, um, ERP charges are typically lowered during the major school vacation periods uh, because there's just lower traffic demand during that time. Um, and with the ERP, uh, it was also possible for us to implement uh, shoulder pricing. So this to mitigate the undesirable effects of the large discrete uh, changes in pricing. And so compared to the ALS, which charged on a per day basis, uh, so ERP charges on a per use basis, and that actually better reflects uh, the marginal external costs uh, of the car trip. So LTA's uh, chief engineer uh, wrote back in uh, 2005 that in the initial months after the transition from ALS to the ERP, uh, volume in traffic volumes into the CBD fell about 10 to 15 percent. So it was quite likely that uh, ERP had especially influenced the behavior of those who previously made multiple trips uh, into the CBD. And many of these multiple trip makers uh, had reduced their car trips. Uh, for example, the office workers uh, no longer used their cars uh, to go attend midday meetings or to go out for lunch and then come back in again. Uh, in fact, uh, they, would, they would then rely on the public transport, public transit system instead. And, and obviously, uh, the automation alleviates the enforcement labor constraint, so allowing congestion charging to be practically deployed to more hotspots around the island, so in the form of point-based charging. So when necessary, uh, ERP uh, will and can be expanded to new locations uh, where the congestion hotspots or congestion levels warranted. Uh, so for example, uh, in the 2000, mid-2000s, uh, it was expanded beyond the CBD to include roads and expressways island-wide, which were more congested uh, during the morning and uh, evening peak hours. So um, let me now make a few uh, brief remarks on how the ERP rates are determined. So simply put, uh, these are based on traffic conditions of the roads, where the ERP system is in operation, and also vehicle sizes as measured by a passenger car unit. So for example, if you're a driver of a large uh, truck, or a large commercial vehicle, uh, you are typically charged one and a half times to two times uh, compared to drivers of a passenger car. And if you happen to be riding a motorcycle, uh, you probably pay about 50% uh, less. Um, rates are also reviewed every quarter, uh, and if necessary, they're adjusted uh, to achieve the optimal traffic flow on the roads. So, um, so my road traffic engineering colleagues uh, have determined that uh, at the speed range of 20 to 30 kilometers per hour on the arterial roads and 45 to 65 kilometers per hour on expressways, those are kind of the optimal speeds, optimal traffic flows uh, that we could expect uh, with the ERP. Now, uh, some might say that the ERP's inability to perform or real-time dynamic charging might be an impediment, right? Uh, so yes, we do recognize that uh, uh, there are uh, examples of real-time tolling uh, in practice with managed lanes in some parts of the US, uh, but uh, it was clearly a design consideration uh, to go with a different approach. Uh, with the review of the ERP rates quarterly and with the changes that are, if you're going to make any changes, you're going to be publishing those ahead of implementation, uh, we think that the motorists will then be able to make more informed driving decisions instead of being confronted with new and changing uh, information while en route, uh, where they might have little opportunity uh, to react. Now, the more fundamental issue uh, with, with ERP uh, or the current ERP system is that it is infrastructure heavy and it is increasingly more expensive to maintain as it reaches its end of life. So the gantries, uh, you can see a picture there, uh, can also be a potential visual disability, although some people say that that's a pretty much iconic part of uh, modern day Singapore. 
well, regardless, I think uh, we will give it to London uh, for implementing a system that is a lot less visually intrusive because they do and they do have a system that's enforced by uh, cameras and not by uh, gantries. Okay, now uh, moving on to the next generation uh, ERP or uh, next gen uh, ERP for short. Uh, as its name suggests, uh, we are going to be using this uh, new system to replace the current one in future. Uh, we are going to have uh, what we call onboard units or OBUs, uh, kind of like a tech refresh uh, uh, to be ready for next gen ERP. And when these OBUs will tap on the uh, global navigation satellite system uh, to help transit the current ERP uh, from, the, from the current gantry based system to one that's less costly to build and maintain, uh, one that's more space efficient. Uh, and one that requires shorter lead time to implement. Uh, the next gen ERP uh, also provides additional value added services to motorists, uh, such as uh, it allows you to give uh, allows us to give them advanced notifications on charging locations. It allows us to give them information on real time uh, traffic uh, going beyond congestion or uh, traditional congestion pricing. Okay, so uh, what lies ahead for how uh, next gen can support the future of road pricing policy? Again, I'm happy to share some personal thoughts in this slide and next, uh, again, uh, but these do not necessarily reflect uh, LTA's official position. Okay, from a technical point of view, uh, next gen definitely allows us more flexible expansion of congestion pricing and other pricing policies, such as distance-based pricing. Uh, however, um, there doesn't actually seem to be a very strong argument for fundamentally changing the congestion framework, congestion pricing framework that I just elaborated in the previous slide. Uh, especially post-pandemic, the impetus for change is even less apparent. Well, this is because uh, the CBD coordinate pricing has been zero since the start of the pandemic, and it has remained so um, even to today as we transition into an endemic uh, new norm uh, just about three, four months ago. It is really the first time since 1975 that car travel into the CBD has been zero rated. And though some low traffic volumes at some locations have returned to pre-pandemic levels, uh, flexi work patterns have resulted in a structural shift in traffic peaks, which are better smoothened out now. And so uh, of the uh, 77 gantries that were in operation uh, before the pandemic, uh, only 19 are uh, operating as of today. But beyond congestion pricing, uh, there are bigger structural shifts uh, on the horizon. So under our Singapore Green Plan uh, 2030, we have a national net zero emissions target by 2050. And so to achieve this target, uh, the land transport sector needs to decarbonize by 80% from our 2016 peak, because the, the sector currently contributes about 15% of our carbon emissions. Hence, uh, in what we are now calling a carbon constraint, uh, we need a greener land transport system with less private vehicles, especially internal combustion engine vehicles, and more active mobility in public transport use. So now I'm de actually deliberately decoupling the word congestion from pricing here because as I've just alluded to, the road pricing of future may have other broader social objectives beyond uh, congestion management. Uh, again, uh, some of the ideas in the slides are not implemented or even planned yet. Uh, and of course they do, and some of them do obviously go beyond what next gen was uh, designed for. But uh, some, of, some of these uh, pot potential ideas on how we can think about uh, the pricing of the future um, are, are, are as follows. So if we need to make deeper cuts in our land transport carbon emissions uh, beyond what we have committed to so far, uh, mileage-based charging and supported by next gen, of course, uh, could be a part of the policy mix. And some, pol uh, some academics in Singapore have suggested this precisely. Uh, relatedly, there could be differential charging for vehicles of different carbon emissions intensity. So petrol or gasoline uh, and diesel cars could be charged at a higher rate than EVs or zero emissions vehicles. Uh, for example, uh, in fact, in London, uh, drivers of pure EVs are currently exempted from paying uh, this congestion charge. And I also note from work done uh, by the Mineta Transportation Institute in the US uh, that there is actually some support for green framing of uh, road user charges. Uh, now, and future technologies may allow us to be nimbler in setting up new charge points allowing us to preemptively shape driving behavior in anticipation of uh, road reclamation or road repurposing should we wish to. And uh, tradable driving credits, uh, which have been discussed in the transportation literature, can put a hard cap on the aggregate number of vehicle miles driven in any given time frame. Uh, and of course, if you wanted to do that, uh, that needs to be supported by usage readings that can be collected by the authority. So it is this uh, hard cap on uh, vehicle ownership that will briefly turn to next uh, in the remaining five minutes or so. 
Okay. Singapore's vehicle uh, ownership policies complement those that target vehicle usage. Uh, since the 1950s, uh, we have rolled out vehicle ownership measures in the form of taxes and import duties, uh, but the car population continued to rise. It, uh, it surged by about 65% from 1980 to 1989. Uh, in fact, a study by some Singaporean economists in 1990 found that income elasticity of cars was about plus two, uh, while the price elasticity was just under a minus 0 0.5. So in the heady days of the 1980s, where we had very rapid growth, uh, personal incomes were rising rapidly, uh, taxation policy by itself would struggle to contain uh, the car population. So this situation uh, resulted in the introduction of a vehicle quota system in 1990, allowing the government to exercise more effective control over the vehicle population in the country. Uh, we set a quota on the number of new vehicles registered in Singapore each year based on the allowable growth rate that we access to be sustainable in the long term. So anyone who wants to register a new vehicle would first need to bid for a certificate of entitlement, we call that COE, uh, then that's valid for 10 years. Uh, renewals are possible at the prevailing quarter premium. Uh, COEs are allocated through a fortnightly auction mechanism uh, with the successful bidders paying a uniform price of highest and successful price plus uh, $1. A current allowable growth rate for cars and motorcycles is at 0%. So meaning that quotas available for bidding comes purely from the deregistrations or the scrapping of vehicles uh, uh, that, um, in, in, that, that are coming from the stock. And so no new growth uh, is allowed. So I have just uh, touched on the effectiveness and the efficiency principles of our uh, VQS. Uh, let me briefly now turn to the other principles that we think are important as well for the overall design. And, and here we are trying to uh, strike a balance between uh, these five principles uh, in designing the VQS. Now, on equity, uh, we need to have a system that is fair for all existing and prospective vehicle owners. So we try to do that by, number one, making COEs time limited to 10 years. And number two, by having separate quota categories. So as you can see, uh, we have two categories for cars. Uh, category A for the mass market cars, category B for the luxury cars, um, category C is for commercial vehicles, D for motorcycles, uh, and E can be, it's, it's, op it's an open category that can be used to register any other uh, vehicle uh, except a motorcycle. So this categorization encompasses some elements of uh, social equity uh, within the VQS. So for example, uh, motorcycle buyers do not have to bid with the buyers of the larger um, luxury vehicles uh, who more likely have the higher purchasing power. Likewise, uh, the mass market car buyers do not also compete with uh, the luxury car buyers in the bidding process. So while we note that uh, from the ideal efficiency design perspective, to have, you should have a single car category, we have decided to retain that distinction of uh, two, the A, the A and the B. And uh, very briefly on uh, responsiveness and stability, uh, as vehicles are deregistered, um, the intent is to replace the supply as promptly as we can while attempting to smoothen the volatility uh, over time. So by, for example, determining the quota that is available for bidding uh, based on the number of uh, some moving average of the vehicle deregistered over the previous uh, four quarters. Okay. Now, uh, in the last minute or so remaining, um, as I conclude, um, so I'd like to remind everyone that Singapore's vehicle ownership and usage measures, uh, trailblazing as they are, are just one pillar of our plans to build a uh, more resilient and sustainable uh, land transport system. Uh, we have a 20 minute town, 45 minutes city vision uh, with mass adoption of uh, what we call walk cycle ride modes. Simply put, by 2040, nine in 10 active mobility public transport and shared transport journeys during the peak period will be completed within 45 minutes. So how will we get there? Uh, Mike spoke a bit about congestion pricing and uh, carpooling being complementary. So I'm going to give you another soundbite, which is congestion pricing and good public transport are also complementary. So we are going to expand the public transport system. Uh, there will be 360 kilometers of uh, rail network by 2030, which will help connect eight in 10 households within 10 minutes of a train station. We completed a major bus service and enhancement program. Uh, in the mid-2010s, we expanded the bus fleet by 35%, improving the capacity of bus services. Uh, we will press on with polycentricity to bring jobs closer to home, uh, bringing more homes in the business, central business district, intens intensifying the land use uh, of the transport nodes. And uh, finally, we will be facilitating sustainable transport and green uh, commutes 
uh, we'll be expanding our cycling path. Uh, we will be developing car light precincts. And uh, we will also be uh, and encouraging greener commutes, phasing out internal combustion engines and uh, electrifying more of our buses. Uh, and with that, I uh, just want to thank you for listening.